Good morning from Columbia University in the city of New York. My name is Tanya Domi, and I am an adjunct professor with the Hearman Institute's Balkan Studies program. The Hearman Institute at Columbia University is one of the world's leading academic institutions for the study of Russia, Eurasia, and East Central Europe. Our mission is to serve our community at the university and beyond by supporting research instruction and dialogue, sponsoring vibrant and multidisciplinary events that bring together our extraordinary resources of faculty, students, and alumni. We are committed to training the next generation of regional specialists to play leadership roles in setting the academic and scholarly agenda, making policy and challenging accepted truths about how we study our rapidly changing world. Today, we will hear from top Balkan analysts on the parallels of Russian bellicosity in the Balkans in the example of the Ukraine situation and the ongoing war with Russia. This remains a major concern among not only analysts, but for the people who live in the non-EU and NATO member states in the former Yugoslavia. The Russian war against Ukraine actually began in February 2014 and was relaunched into a hot war again on February 24th this year. From a legal standpoint, this war appears to be not only an illegal one, but has been a war crime from day one, reflected in the indis indiscriminate shelling of apartment buildings, hospitals, schools, and theaters, noting not a single military target among these attacks. Estimates as many as 20,000 people may have been killed in Maripol, and the targeted rapes of women and girls have been reported since the second week of the war. The International Criminal Court prosecutor announced a new investigation of potential war crimes in the first days of the war and has since made a trip to Ukraine to consult with the Ukraine prosecutor general. How there will be accountability for these war crimes remains to be seen, but without question, the Ukraine war and its consequences will be a challenge to not only international justice, but also with respect to the Atlantic Security Alliance and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. We will discuss all these issues and much, much more. I ask our audience to submit questions and comments via the chat on Zoom and YouTube, where the live stream is now broadcasting, and we will try to answer as many of them as possible. We open today's program with journalist Una Hadari, who was recently in Poland and Ukraine reporting on the war. She is a freelance journalist focused on nationalism, minorities, and far-right groups. She has reported widely from the Western Balkans for the past nine years. I now turn the microphone over to you, Una. Hi, thank you, Tanya, for having me today. And I'm so happy to be having the rest of you as co-panelists to discuss this um, complex topic, but definitely one that um, has a great relevance in the Balkans. I feel that no other community in the world understands exactly what Ukraine, Ukraine is facing, not only because of the level of violence and uh, terror exercise on, on its citizens, but also because of the mo motives and the way the war has been um, has been developing so far. Um, I'm just sort of just going to go over some of the things I observed, um, uh, you know, in, in the relatively brief, but, you know, a uh, week or so that I was in Ukraine recently. Um, but then the things that, that I'll bring up or highlight will be things that I feel could be, you know, relevant to, to the discussion going forward. Um, so the first thing uh, that is evident to anyone who's been to Ukraine since, and this is, I say this having in mind, uh, being someone who has covered um, Ukraine before, uh, before this war and has been in, you know, lived in the country or been in the country for significant periods, periods of time before the war. Um, you know, people are fine, are very happy that there's finally an interest in what's going on. Obviously, the, the um, period since 2015, obviously, the war started in 2014, but 2015, when there's when, when 2015 and 16, when the situation in the Donbass region, uh, the fighting on the, in the Donbass region 
um, went down to a lower level of intensity than we had seen initially in 2014, it, it was completely impossible, um, almost completely impossible to write or cover it by Ukraine in any way because there wasn't an interest in the global audience um, uh, and you know, amongst international outlets for coverage from the country. Um, and this is obviously radically changed and people feel that people are people in Ukraine, Ukrainians, Ukrainian citizens feel there's finally an interest in what's going on in the country and in, in their identity and their existence separate from Russia. Um, a lot of the coverage before, a lot of the interest before was um, sort of, you know, was highlighted, was focused on comparing um, uh, Ukraine with Russia and trying to set up, you know, presenting the countries presenting Ukraine as, you know, uh, a peril to, um, uh, to Ru Russian society um, in many ways. Um, this is the first thing that I like that, I mean, I've, everyone's seen, everyone's reported, but I, it needs to be highlighted. The second thing that's really, that, that was amazing was the level of solidarity and organization in the country. While I don't think, I mean, I don't know how many, um, whether it's, uh, um, as a journalist, I should be saying this right now, since we're, relative hopefully in the late stages of the war but since it's only been a month and a half and a lot of analysis has been has to be done has yet to be done in the ways um uh, the country has reacted but if anything me and my colleagues agree that if there was a perfect response to the war um it's something that we're witnessing with ukrainian institutions the level they be pulled together both the army the parliament the government um in sort of creating a, a completely unified response whether it's caring for civilians, evacuating civilian, civilians, responding to international requests, staying on top of, you know, uh, in, you know, communications with international leaders and stuff like that, especially as someone from the Balkans, when I remember how the response in certain countries was divided and uncoordinated early on, I, you know, it's so inspiring to see this in Ukraine. And the, the other thing, um, you know, obviously all these cities are constantly fa facing air raids, Every two or three hours, um, you know, everyone needs to go into shelter or or get up, you know, to a location uh, that's less likely to be hit by Russian missiles. Um, psycho this is even in Lviv, which until actually recently didn't see very much. Um, it wasn't attacked. Thankfully, it wasn't attacked as much as as other cities sadly were, um, and that kind of disrupts. Your, and their curfews and hedgehogs, you know, those metal contraptions that are supposed to stop tanks from entering the city and stuff like that all over Lviv. And, and it psychologically creates this, this perception of, I mean, no, perception, this pressure on citizens um, uh, uh, when their country's, uh, uh, you know, facing, facing a war. And um, the last thing is, that I feel is really important is, um, or the, and the question I've been getting most from my colleagues in Ukraine is, uh, relate to the NATO interventions, obviously. Um, there is a massive anger at the West for not taking more decisive steps and militarily becoming involved in the conflict directly or sending certain, um, uh, you know, certain weapons into the country. You know, um, I was there at the point where Poland was, you know, still thinking about whether it would be sending weapons in and how that would happen and, and stuff like that. And people were extremely disappointed because they were like, it's so evident that this is such an existential moment for, you know, 40 million people, 44 million people, but let's assume some of them evacuated, you know, um, for 44 million, a country of 44 million. And the fact that it takes the West so long to react is sort of disappoint us inherently about the feeling about, you know, um, what we want, what we expect and, 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 and thought we could, uh, you know, expect from the West. So those things mainly, and um, yeah, I, I, I have a couple more points I'd like to make, but I think I'll try to feed them into conversations as we get onto concrete topics and they relate to the Balkans. Thank you very much, Una. I'd now like to uh, introduce Ralph Bayerovich, who's the vice president at the US-Europe Alliance in Washington, DC. Previously, he served as president of the Emerging Democracies Institute, also in DC and was president of the Civic Alliance political party in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I now turn the microphone over to you, Ralph. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be sharing the podium with the, these excellent, excellent people. This is a, an amazing group that, that Tanya has put together and I will thank her uh, for that. So, <clears throat> 
I think the most important um, aspect of, of the war in Ukraine for key players in the Balkans is the fact that Russia can no longer uh, provide any sort of reinforcement or uh, cannot even uh, really reach the Balkans via air after this. I think people who are not from the Western Balkans under, underestimate how important this is for uh, everybody really who deals with the uh, public issues in the region. Uh, the Russians are now in a position where their proxies are essentially isolated. So if you're Mr. Dodik, you can't rely on Russians to, you know, the, the, the Russian cal calorie, calorie to appear over the horizon at, at the key moment. Um, and that changes the calculus uh, com completely. No, not, not a 180, but a 160 in my view. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a major, major disruption for Russian proxies in the region. Uh, as a result of this inability uh, of Putin to help anybody in the Balkans, his, his allies, I mean, uh, the, the calculus has changed for uh, everyone in the region, but most importantly for uh, people who are close to Russia and relied on Russia. So Kosovo and Bosnia, in my view, are in a much better position than they were before the war in Ukraine started. And had Ukraine fallen very quickly, I think the position for these two countries would have been very, very difficult. But the fact that Ukraine had defended so well uh, has made the, the main sources of danger for these countries, basically RS and Serbia, uh, much more unwilling to take risks. Um, additionally, the U4 reinforcements in Bosnia, I think, are very consequential. I'm very much curious as to what Kurt is going to say about this, what he thinks about this. But I think it's, it's important because this is the first time in 16, 17 years that the EU has uh, acknowledged the yawning security gap that we have in Bosnia. So the deterrence, failure of deterrence is now finally acknowledged. Finally, you have people in Brussels who say, yes, you're right. There is a problem with, uh, with, with the you know, six, 700 soldiers in Bosnia and the additional 500, 550 do not change the calculus completely, but they do a very important thing, which is they change the narrative, which I think is, is exceptionally important for Bosnia and for the region. Uh, the third thing I want to mention is that the EU, the sorry, the US has changed its uh, course somewhat because what we have, there's a huge breaking story today. The Bosnian uh, uh, head of Bosnia's uh, uh, joint staff, basically the, the main military person in the country, has come out and uh, said that the US has promised, the Pentagon has promised him uh, javelin stingers and some other goodies. Now this this is it is impossible to overstate how important this is for Bosnia because this makes the country so much more secure because the military is somewhat well staffed. It, it is uh, fa fairly well equipped, but javelins and stingers would make whatever Serbia has and whatever even whatever Croatia has a much less effective in Bosnia if you take into account the terrain in Bosnia, which is exceptionally remote and is very difficult. You know, the country is difficult to attack. So Turkey has also promised considerable uh, weaponry to Bosnia, uh, allegedly rocket systems, you know, and some serious jamming equipment as well, which they're good at. Uh, there are allegations that the uh, Bayraktars are also on the way, which would then completely, uh, you know, change the Bosnian capabilities. But even without Bayraktars, what we heard today from the Mr. Marshevich, who is the head of the Bosnian army, uh, is, is extremely consequential. Also, I think the Ukraine crisis makes uh, Kosovo uh, much, much more likely to receive uh, additional support uh, in terms of security and military structures. And there was uh, information circulating about uh, the laws, the British anti-tank, anti-armor weapons being provided to Kosovo, then it was denied. But I think there will be, a, 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 it's much more likely that Kosovo will get uh, additional support as well. Uh, Macedonia, Montenegro, and Albania, I think, have nothing to worry about because they are already in NATO. And the, the fact that Russians can't appear in the region anymore means that they are essentially as secure as they, they've been in a long time. Uh, and I think the mood, when I talk to people in, uh, in these countries, the mood is really, you know, they feel much more secure and much more self-assured than they did uh, previously, especially in Montenegro, which was sort of under... Uh, under a microscope uh, because of the government change in 2020. Uh, so I think Serbia feels uh, 
feels I think there's a, there's a period of in, introspection in Serbian security structures and, and the Serbian military because overwhelming uh, amount of Serbian weaponry is is uh, is Russian. So what we see now in on, on the battlefields around Ukraine is that Russian armor is is it perceived by many to be a death trap. So it, it will change the calculus in Serbian uh, security structures uh, because they are really not sure what to do next. Uh, the, the acquisition of the Chinese made, the Chinese version of S-300s is important for them, but the, the major uh, uh, elements of the Serbian army are really modeled on what, what the Russians have. And this, this will change their, uh, their, their outlook very, very much so. Um, I think the, politically, the biggest loser in the region by far is Mr. Dodik, who is the closest and the most important Russian proxy in the region. His uh, secessionist drive will, uh, you know, will change now. I think he's going to give up, and, and I, I hope that I'm right, but I, I'm pretty certain that he, he does not, he does simply, there's no room for him to continue doing what he's doing. He'll continue threatening to do that, but I don't think he'll, at the end, he's already, of course, backed down on some of his plans. Um, because there is no way for him to to have receive any kind of support should he uh you know it, it would essentially be a suicide mission let's just put it this way uh Vucic, i think has played his hand cunningly so far he's uh managed to to walk a very thin line he's appeased the west you know they they're they're absolutely ecstatic about the vote in the u.n general assembly but on the other hand he hasn't completely made the russians mad because he refused to introduce sanctions sanctions against russia uh, and I think despite the, the, the vote against Russia at the UN General Assembly, I think he is still considered uh, somewhat close to Moscow. I think the Russians are, are going to try to pressure him to, uh, you know, do more to, to show public support public, personally for, for what they're doing in Ukraine. Uh, bottom line, I think the, the region is less unstable because of, well, because of the war in Ukraine. And I, this is all due to the heroic, heroic performance of the Ukrainian army, which I think we should always acknowledge and, you know, people in the region are exceptionally thankful to, to, to the Ukrainian uh, nation and, you know, their heroic resistance against aggression, which has made the, this region much more uh, secure. But however, uh, the Western policy, uh, despite the changes in, in uh, security posture in Bosnia, uh, is still Serbia centric. I think that has not changed. And I will stop there. Thanks, Ralph. Um, our next uh, speaker is Kurt Bassinger, who is co-founder and senior associate of the Democratization Policy Council, a Berlin-based think tank established in 2005. He uh, earned his PhD last year at the University of St. Andrews Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political uh, Violence and um, has written his dissertation on peace cartels, internationally brokered power sharing and perpetual oligarchy in Bosnia Herzegovina and North Macedonia. Over to you, Kurt. Well, thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much for having me on this, this august panel. I'll try to pick up where Rafe left off. I'll just make a note. I mean, my connection with Ukraine was, it's where I lived immediately before moving to Bosnia in 2005. Uh, briefly, albeit I was I was there as the political and campaign analyst for the uh, ODIR election observation mission, which in the election that begat the Orange Revolution. So uh, civic self confidence, you, you could see that build there. I wish we could get more of that here. Um, I think we're at the beginning of a reckoning in Bosnia, but we're at the beginning of a reckoning with no strategy. There is no strategy evident on the western side. I, I agree with Rayo that there's still basically a default. Serbia-centric strategy, if you want to call that, approach is probably a more accurate phrasal. Um, uh, reinforcement of U4 was absolutely important. It was clear, given how quickly it happened, that it was in the works prior to February 24th. And the composition of the troops probably would not have been the same had the invasion, the, 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 the latest invasion not happened. I mean, the Romanian, Slovak, I mean, these are frontline states with Ukraine. So that composition may change. Hopefully that will be reinforced further. Um, I mean, the, the paradox here is, and, and Bosnia-Herzegovina is the center of a regional conflict system. There is no Srpski spet if Republika Srpska is not on the menu, effectively. And so the paradox is, 
the West is more empowered in the Balkans broadly and in Bosnia and Herzegovina in particular than anywhere else in the world. And yet we are allowing the local actors and regional actors to effectively steer our policy. Uh, mainly because I think there's still an investment in this idea that the, the political actors in, in the region actually want to join the EU and, and, and meet, meet the conditions to join the club. And I think the, the evidence points in the other direction. Um, so I think we're winning it right now. Uh, the reckoning that began with supporting the high representative in, in opposing the state property law that Republika Srpska was pushing, but he just put the brakes on it. He didn't abolish it. And unfortunately, uh, there still seems to be an idea that we, the, the real thing to do is to find a com an accommodation among the, the ethnic, you know, tribal political leaders in Bosnia, rather than than to try to try to limit their about ability to do damage. So I'm less sanguine than Rayuk is about the p potential for for mischief. I don't think he's wrong. I agree with you. That, that Russia's ability, for example, to fly paratroopers to Banja Luka is, is not what it was previously. Um, uh, but they have other ways to, 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 to kick up trouble if they want to. And obviously the incentive is as high as it's ever been given what's happening in, in Ukraine. So the good news is we could prevent that. The bad news is I don't think we're properly postured to prevent that right now. Uh, and in terms of, of, of weapon systems, you know, the, the army of Bosnia-Herzegovina, at least in the analysis that we've done, if it were under pressure, it would probably collapse into its, its individual ethnic units uh, at, the, at the battalion level. So the fact that there would be these weapons is great, but they would probably end up going to the police. You know, I don't know what caveats are put on this, but uh, I, I'm not sure that the, the, the Bosnian military under the current political configuration would have an awfully hard time getting the orders to defend the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the real, the real threat is internal. And that, again, that's what the safe and secure environment under Annex 1A of the Dayton Peace Agreement is all about. But uh, this, this is why, given the security environment, we already got a hint prior to February 24th that the Russians and Chinese were willing to cooperate on Bosnia in the UN Security Council. Uh, there's, there's a vote coming up in November for renewal of the U4 mandate. That will probably go, go badly. So the point is to get enough troops here prior to that to justify stay, saying Annex 1A is eternal. As long as there's a Dayton, there's an Annex 1A. And as long as there's a Dayton, there's a high rep and we'll support them. So the good news, international support, universal Western support for the high reps actions, probably some more enthusiastic than others. Uh, but still no strategy. And uh, on top of that, we're still treating Bosnia Herzegovina uh, as a condominium of the neighboring states. That's something that's relatively new. That was not the case at the time, immediately after Dayton was signed. Uh, and I believe that pressure has been applied to both Zagreb and Belgrade to get on side. Uh, Ray talked about, about, uh, about the UNGA vote of Serbia. A lot of intelligence agents, uh, diplomats, uh, Russian diplomats have, have left Zagreb right after the strategic dialogue. But there still is this, this game to try to accommodate um, uh, Dragan Chovic, the HDZ uh, leader here in Bosnia. So I worry that, that in the absence of a strategy, we'll continue on a glide path that effectively pursues the same aims as Russian policy has been pursuing before the war, uh, uh, before the, the invasion, I should say. So um, the one thing that the Ukrainians in their brave resistance and, and excellently represented by, by President Zelensky has re-injected into the debate that has yet to be represented in Western policy toward the Balkans is values. Democratic values are now being defended in Ukraine He's been very good at shaming the West. Uh, he should keep doing it. We deserve it. Uh, but we do not have those values reflected in our approach to the leaders of the region and to the citizens of the region, most importantly, who, who are hungry for somebody to stand up for those. We haven't been doing it. We've been in a very transactional year 
So I worry about that, that downside of geopolitics. Obviously, there's a need to secure, secure the region, but the only way it's really secure is if the citizens of these countries have representative democracies. Uh, and we're not really pushing that. Uh, and we have an opportunity to do so. So um, I'll wrap up now. I think there's everything to fight for. There's an opening. I think parliamentarians across the transatlantic world have been more tuned in to the possibilities and the potential and the stakes than the executives have. Uh, and I think that uh, that's to be applauded. And hopefully the senators who were just here yesterday will take that, take that back with them. They're in Pristina today and they go to Brussels tomorrow. Uh, so uh, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you for having me. So, yeah. Thanks, Kurt. Our next uh, presenter is Ivana Stradner, who serves as an advisor to the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Barish Center for Media Integrity, where her research focuses on Russia's information operations and cybersecurity, particularly Russia's use of advanced forms of hybrid warfare and the threat they pose to the West. Um, we're delighted to have Ivana back at Hiraman. She's a prolific writer and uh, people should follow her. You have the microphone, uh, Ivana. Thank you very much, Tanya, for inviting me also um, this year to discuss um, a very important um, subject um, in terms of the war in Ukraine. And I would like to particularly focus on Russia's hybrid warfare and how it actually translates to, to the Western Balkans. So what we are seeing right now in Ukraine, um, this is really nothing new because in terms of the hybrid warfare, because Russia has been using the same type of warfare since early 2014. Um, uh, to size Crimea. Um, and in terms of the novelty, this is again, you know, nothing new uh, because many people, I think they, they overestimate the novelty of information warfare. This is all based on, on an old uh, Soviet toolkit. So the only thing really that it, that it is new is the role of social media and, and, and how it can actually amplify information operations. To begin with, I think one of the major problems that we in the West have is that in countering Russian information operations is that we do not understand information operations in the same way, um, even like a hybrid warfare. Russia, for example, sees hybrid warfare as a type of conflict rather than the means of waging it. We understand it completely differently. Uh, over there, for example, conventional military forces uh, are subordinate to an information uh, campaign. And really just you should read the Russian uh, information strategy was written back like a 22 years ago. And believe it or not, Putin was really inspired by the 1990 uh, events in the Balkans, because he firmly believed that uh, the West was waging information war in the Balkans. Uh, but the real question is, how is Russia managing to do um, information operations? So on the strategic level, you know, the Russian government uses informational cover and consistent denial um, in order to pollute information space. So just think about what happened in January. So uh, Russia's political and military officials, they repeatedly denied readiness to use the force in Ukraine. Luckily this time around, United Kingdom and United States opted for a different strategy and they put forward Russian false flag operations and they're continue doing that uh, to date. Um, so, a Russian information campaign is actually the most effective at the beginning of a combat operation. So uh, what we are gonna see, we are going to see, I would not say not less information operations, but different types of information operations depending, depending on the type of, of the region where we're going to continue using military force. And this is really counterintuitive, but I always tell people, um, 
read carefully what the Russian government is saying, believe them when they say it. Because prior to all major uh, attacks in any war, they first use information operations to lay actually the groundwork and to lay um, the justification for the operations, and then they execute it. Um, I'll just give you a few examples. For example, the Russian government has been making numerous false claims about the use of chemical weapons, um, and they use that basically to try to blame the Ukrainians so they can justify it back home. But also in terms of like a bioweapons, um, they claim that the United States was training migratory birds um, to deliver bioweapons. Uh, and a few days ago, believe it or not, but the Russian embassy uh, in, in, in Bosnia uh, delivered another um, Another false accusation basically claiming that um, Germany and United States um, uh, were preparing like a different types of like a drones with, uh, with, uh, with, with bioweapons. So the real question is also how this translates everywhere. Like the West, I think this time around protected itself very, very well from the Russian disinformation campaign. I can talk about some specific steps that the West uh, has taken so far. But I have to tell you, um, even though everyone is celebrating the end of Russian information war, Russia is quite successful elsewhere. You should really just see what Russia is doing successfully in Africa. Africa and how they're very, very uh, powerfully conveying information in Africa. And we all know, you know, why strategically that region is important. The same thing, you know, translates in the Balkans. Um, uh, so I can talk later, you know, more in detail about this topic. Uh, but in the Balkans, really, Russia has used information operations for at least the past of the decade to accomplish its goals, like a strategically to undermine democracy, the European Union and NATO. Of course, you know, um, this time around, such information campaigns um, delivered like mixed results because you have, I don't know, countries that are more pro-Western. So they took certain you know, steps, for example, to ban Russia media. But you, of course, you know, have uh, Russia's proxies in Serbia and as well as in Republika Srpska. They were actually amplifying Russian rhetorics, denying the war in Ukraine, uh, justifying the conflict, basically um, just repeating the Moscow's uh, typical rhetorics. And this was actually also a very problematic um, in addition to everything what I just stated so far, because the Serbia, Serbia also had elections. So the president of Serbia also had additional incentive to amplify uh, the Russian rhetorics, but it's not only that. He, let's not forget that he was a minister of information back in the 90s, and he understands very well the power of media and why making the media darkness in a, in a country can actually help you uh, shape the narrative. So this time around, he, instead of just, you know, boosting the Russian rhetorics, he opted on several different fronts, com making completely, completely polluting information space, uh, cheering for, for, for China, but also trying to balance between Washington and, and Brussels. So uh, I, at this time around, I really don't think that any kinetic use of force is possible in the Balkans. Who knows, maybe something can change next week or next year. Uh, but one thing that I'm quite certain that information war is definitely going to continue in the Balkans, not only from external factors, but also internal factors. And I think the West, specifically the US and the UK, should take should take this seriously and counter uh, not only Russian disinformation campaign, but also coming from China, but also internally. Thank, thank you, Ivana, very much. Okay, we're gonna go to Richard Kramer, our last uh, presenter. Uh, Richard is a non-resident senior fellow at the European Values Center for Security Policy in Prague, the Czech Republic. His research there focuses on malign foreign interventions by Russia and China in Central and Southeastern Europe. He is also a non-resident scholar for the Frontier Europe Initiative at the Middle East Institute and a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Richard, you have the microphone. Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, my gratitude to you and to the Harriman Institute, my, my co-panelists and for everyone who's here today. 
uh, speaking about what we continue to believe is a most vital topic, and that is the security and democratic trajectory of the Western Balkans. And how is the West responding to it right now, given the, the war in Ukraine? Also, given the fact that Viktor Orban and his Fidesz party have been given an electoral mandate in Hungary, and Alexander Vucic and his SNS have been given something similar in Serbia going forward. And so how do we approach this? Well, indeed, there's uh, judging from everyone's remarks today, there seems to be a consensus that we're lacking a strategy. And while I'm very encouraged, particularly by the news that Ray have shared this morning uh, regarding the provision of weapons to Bosnia and Herzegovina and some other signs that we've seen that give us cause for encouragement, that strategic focus is still lacking. And, and correspondence I've had with Tanya, she has noted, and it's been my observation as well, that there doesn't really seem to be as of yet, far we can tell, the kind of coordinated communication and input amongst Democrats in various Western Balkan capitals that needs to start happening. Those Democrats that are both in civil society as well as in the government to the extent they exist. This is an inflection point. I thought the inflection point was in Afghanistan in August, but boy, was I wrong. And, and, and you know, the, the ramifications of this as, as we, have, we can barely begin to start to consider them. And it's difficult to assess because the war appears to me to be not ending anytime, especially soon. With that, a strategy for the Western Balkans or even more broadly speaking for the Euro-Atlantic space is in order. And since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's been a lot of questions about the role of NATO and other transatlantic alliances in respect to what their role and what their purpose might be. Well, Vladimir Putin has, has gone ahead. I mean, in my estimate, he's given us a common purpose for a while. It seems to be one that is increasingly recognized by our allies on both sides of the Atlantic. And that is that Russia under Vladimir Putin as its continual autocratic self needs to be contained, eroded, and if possible, reformed to the extent that it could be an effective, democratic, positively contributing member of the world community as difficult as it is to foresee that in the immediate future. But that should be one common purpose and it should be equally applied to other authoritarian trending uh, countries in, within the same space. I've been encouraged that the Biden administration has been therefore reaching out as, as it has to some of the largest democracies in Europe. It could do a lot more, um, certainly reaffirming NATO's purpose. And as Kurt noted, I completely agree um, the emphasis on democratic principles, which are enshrined in the NATO charter. I would also argue that I think we're about ready to start having discussions about Ukraine's reconstruction and political future as the polls have advocated. It's better that we get ahead of this sooner rather than later. I would also argue that as part parcel of that, the Biden administration would be good to start getting involved with more international governmental organizations, particularly those of the financial variety to start rooting out the authoritarian influences that have crept in insidiously and taken over substantial aspects of authorities of those organizations in recent years. So I mentioned that Biden's been, the administration has been reaching out to the big democracies in Europe, less so for the Western Balkans. Um, <clears throat> I see this as a failure, uh, not just with this administration, but for a long time in Washington to recognize that there is a malignant connective tissue that runs from Kiev all the way to the border of the European Union and beyond actually into Croatia and Slovenia, arguably in the Western Balkans. And that malignancy is Vladimir Putin's Russia, the ultra nationalist reactionary narratives that they espouse, their efforts to undermine security in Southeastern Europe so it cannot effectively integrate into the Euro-Atlantic space and does so through a range of local actors. Well. I'm going to argue that Russia is going to be a pariah state for at least a generation at this point. We can talk about that, but I would like to point out that in my estimate, even if there's a change in the, in the elites in Moscow, what, I, what we've seen in the past few weeks about the effectiveness of the Russian media propaganda machine, that a majority of Russians, as far as we can tell, given the unreliability of polling in closed societies, have a very different understanding about why this war is being fought and how it's being fought and who's the aggressor and who's the victim. I don't envision that especially once war crime tribunals get underway, that any Russian leader is going to be able to effectively convince the public without putting him or herself at considerable harm that, you know what, everything we said back in 2022, that wasn't true. Actually, here's what really happened. I think that would go, uh, to put it in, in, in context, 
Consider Serbia and how many Serbs view the wars that were fought in Bosnia and Kosovo and who was the aggressor and who was the victim. That's not something that you can just roll back. So I'm arguing that from both a very public sort of fundamental level to an elite level, I don't see Russia coming back into uh, you know, the fold of the global community anytime soon. It will persist as a menace. Therefore, it's incumbent on our diplomatic core, leadership in Foggy Bottom, to actually take this opportunity to recognize that there is a moral high ground to be taken advantage of and by seeking cooperation and information from our allies in various western balkan capitals that we start to put together a strategy to contain and then diminish russians russia's footprint be it political military or economic throughout the western balkans we have the impetus to do this now. And failing to take advantage of this opportunity is not only to the detriment of the people most affected by it, those being the, the citizens of various Balkan states, but by a larger degree for the European transatlantic community. <clears throat> Briefly on the EU, I know I'm running out of time, but I would like to give my accolades to Ursula von der Leyen and others that I'm sure had to be very decisive and very tough given unanimity principles within the European Union to put forward the committed $500 million in arms to aid Ukraine within days of the, of the invasion. That's a very respectable feat. Regrettably, I'm not as confident that the EU is going to be empowered to continue down this kind of road as the, as the conflict goes on, as it becomes more protracted, and given that there's a Russophilic illiberal democracy smack in the middle of Central and Eastern Europe that's being run by a guy by the name of Viktor Orban, who I believe will be conciliatory to the extent that he may, but when tough issues are on the table, I am envisioning that Hungary is going to push back to the benefit of Russia. I'm less certain about how Alexander Vucic is going to respond and how the commission and, and member states are going to engage with the government in Belgrade going forward. I don't have the confidence to assess that at this point, but I do think that there is a measuring stick and it's the extent to which Russia is, and I think this feeds into a bit of what, what Rayef was remarking on, but to the extent that Russia is going to be a pariah isolated state, the higher the degree of that, the less ability that Vucic has to be able to continue his efforts to adeptly walk this line between East and West. And I'll use those terms very, very clearly and purposefully. To the extent that they're less isolated, well, there's more wiggle room. We have to wait to see how the, how the war ends. But I'm thoroughly convinced that once the guns stop firing and there is an unsteady peace, that as Ivana alluded to, and I think some others, while they're, they're, the possibility of kinetic war in the Western Balkans has diminished significantly, it will be the front line of an information war, an economic war, and on other fronts, not just from Russia and not just from China. In fact, it could actually end up being the most contentious space within a, the, what may very well be a Cold War 2.0 for the 21st century, to use a bit of a hackneyed term, but bear with me. And to not go forward without getting substantive input and contribution from democratic leadership in the region and together with the United Kingdom and US and the EU coming together to be able to put forward a strategy that will contain and diminish that Russian footprint, I have a lot of concerns for the democratic trajectory and overall stability of the Western Balkans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, wow, we put a lot on the table to, to talk about. Uh, one of the things that um, I think sticks out, and we haven't really, really addressed very much about this, but Croatia is a member of NATO and they seem to be waffling uh, about what their role is. I know that they initially said they were going to send troops uh, on this uh, effort in, in defense of NATO. Does anybody have any ideas that they might wanna discuss here about Croatia and going forward their role in the Western Balkans? Can I go? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, well, Croatia, Croatia is really in a, in a tough spot because they have a very uh, Russophilic president uh, who's really scandalously, scandalously anti-Ukrainian. So you have Mr. Milanovic uh, talk about Ukraine the way that a, uh, a Russian uh, 
you know, member of parliament would talk. He basically bashed Ukraine um, uh, as a as a failed state, which was uh, honestly speaking, I was I was very surprised. I mean, he was more anti-Ukrainian than I, I dare say than any other EU member state um, official. I've I've not heard Orban talk about Ukraine the way that uh, Croatia's president talked about Ukraine. So I'd be very very surprised if the Croats actually do end up Croatians. Sorry, Croatians do end up. Uh, sending troops or any type of significant help uh, to Ukraine anytime soon. The good news is that the uh, Prime Minister Plankovic uh, does not agree with the president, but the bad news is that they, they're not going to be able to do anything politically uh, as long as Mr. Milanovic uh, continues to behave the way he does. Now, Milanovic is exceptionally, exceptionally anti-Bosnian uh, to go with his anti-Ukrainian sentiments. And I don't use these words very lightly because he has said things about Bosnia that are, um, I mean, I don't, you know, this is worse than Trump. I mean, Trump used to say really, really, you know, undiplomatic things. And Milanovic has, has, has actually beaten that. Milanovic has told the Bosnians, and I'm quoting, to first use soap before you use perfume. Uh, basically, th that's an old, you know, he's, he's telling the Bosnians they're dirty, uh, which is really, I mean, it's, it's ridiculously uh, deranged in, in many ways. But he has uh, brought the, 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 the Croatian influence in Bosnia, in my view, to the lowest level in a, in a very long time. And the problem is that Croatian debate about Bosnia is so far to the right that I think you will cause a lot of problems in the long term for Croatia, even within EU, which has sort of turned a blind eye to what Croatia has been doing in Bosnia for the last five or six years. Because you, you keep in mind that the Croatian uh, cooperation with Russia on Bosnia is not new. It's been going on for at least, at least six years because the Croatian um, uh, diplomats have closely worked with the Russians and Kurt, uh, I see him nodding his head. I know he's gonna add to this. The Croatian diplomats have worked very closely with the Russians in Bosnia on a number of issues. From ranging from uh, uh, gas uh, deliveries to Bosnia, which the HDZ, which is basically Croatia's proxy in Bosnia, has blocked the adoption of an alternative pipeline to the Russian pipeline because Bosnia can only get Russian gas, to uh, support for the uh, electoral law reform, which sadly, as Kurt and uh, Richard have pointed out, and I'm sure somebody else has as well, uh, has become US policy as well. So you have this election reform fetish, which started from, originated from Zagreb, uh, via Moscow has now become a policy that EU, uh, the US and EU both sort of follow. N not completely, but, but very much so. So I, I'd say that Croatia is in, in, in for a wild ride politically because Milanovic, and, and actually today he's repeated some of his remarks, uh, Milanovic is just not going to stop. And I don't, I don't see any political incentive for him to do so because despite his anti-Ukrainian sentiments, uh, and, you know, insults of Bosnia, he remains country's most, Croatia's most popular politician. Thanks, Ralph. Um, uh, Ivana, with respect to this information war that we know is ongoing, um, I am aware that the U.S. State Department and USAID has actually put together quite a bit of initiatives on addressing the media environment uh, across the Western Balkans. And if you were advising them, what would you, there should be, I would think, given where we are now between social media and the tactics of Russia and other states like it, including Serbia, as you pointed out, how would you advise the Americans on, on these projects? Because uh, the last time we did these projects, I was working in the region, uh, and this is the first big initiative to address uh, independent, independent media or the lack thereof in, in over 25 years. Thank you very much for this uh, very, I think, very important question. And diplomacy has never been something that I'm good at, so I'll be very blunt. Um, the Americans should actually seize their lazy diplomacy uh, in, in the Balkans when it comes to countering disinformation. 
Um, the easiest thing, of course, you know, is to pour a bunch of money through different projects um, to different um, government institutions or, or different projects in NGO sector. It is great, don't get me wrong, it's important, but it will not solve uh, the core issue. Um, they need to be more proactive over there. Um, I'll give you a few examples. Um, I'm following very, very closely, for example, Sputnik activities in the Balkans. And they are really doing such a great job. Uh, if you look at their website, maybe it looks very simplistic, but it doesn't matter because numerous other media, they're picking up stories from there. And the United States has very, very powerful tools such as the Voice of America or the Radio for Europe. So uh, one of the ways that we can actually do this is to use alternative media uh, to amplify uh, more democratic messages. Second thing, um, I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, if someone can maybe you know help me understand how is that possible that American taxpayers are paying so much money for additional help in the Balkans, yet if you ask any person in the Balkans, like especially in Serbia, who is uh, providing uh, providing um, assistance, financial assistance, it's always like a China or or Russia. So uh, the United States should definitely call out all those. Um, policymakers uh, in the Balkans and to make sure you know that there is actually a free media and that they're like a projecting, um, projecting um, correct narratives. Um, and the third thing is I read the latest uh, democracy um, report um, by the US and they clearly emphasize that there is uh, a huge problem in the Balkans in terms of uh, in terms of media freedom. That is really number one thing that we need to fight uh, because the only way that we can actually win information war is to be very active and to debunk our to debunk you know lies that are spreading across the Balkans I'll give you the example. Uh, a few days ago, uh, the Serbian government uh, accused the United Kingdom of sending weapons in Kosovo. And you can only imagine how it actually spread across uh, across the region. The day after, of course, you know, the United Kingdom um, issued a statement saying that this was uh, a false uh, a false statement. Uh, for every single lie that is happening in the Balkans, I think both the European Union, Union as well as the United States, as well as the United Kingdom, they should call out of those politicians and to debunk uh, such lies. So that is really number two. And uh, the third thing that I would like to emphasize um, is that they're not only carrots, they should not shy away from using also sticks when it comes to, uh, uh, to uh, media freedom. Um, I understand that it said, you know, this is thing, you know, for diplomats is not to shake the status quo and to um, make sure, you know, there are not any additional problems. But unfortunately, as I said, I do not see any kinetic use of force anytime soon in the Balkans, but I do see a huge information war and we need to go on the offense uh, when it comes to countering uh, information operations in the Balkans. Thank you, thank you, Ivana. We do have a question from our audience and it's to Una and others. Um, and I'll read it to everybody. Pristina seems to be trying to unfreeze a frozen conflict by rather decisive steps towards self-determination that raises the temperature, naturally leading to fluidity, uh, of, um, I'm just sorry, uh, the English here. Fluidity as the ice comes off, especially in the north. I guess maybe North Mitrovica, not sure here. Um, uh, did they pick a good time seeing the Ukraine war and mentioned weakening of Russian allies in the region? Um, or might they just upset their own allies that might have bigger fish to fry and don't want more trouble on the Western Balkan flank. Um, Una, why don't you take a crack at that and then I'll see who else might be interested in uh, addressing it. Yeah, um, actually that kind of ties in what I, with what I wanted to say. Generally, while 
obviously I agree with most of the assessments of the rest of the panelists in the sense that this war has sort of brought an increased attention global um, both the global um, but also EU attention to sort of the um, uh, conflicts that happen on what people in Brussels like to call the EU periphery. But um, I would actually be a lot less optimistic about the way about this leading to um, more actual concrete developments on the ground without significant pressure being applied on Brussels. Um, I say that having in mind that there have been uh, so what the question uh, you broke out a little bit uh, broke off a little bit but i assume the question is about the recent shootings in the north uh on the on the uh, border crossing between serbia and kosovo where kosovo border police were shot at um three days in a row and well as much as we know that these messages of concern from brussels usually issued via twitter um have absolutely no effect on the ground at least they knew what was going on um the eu has eu officials have insane tunnel vision if they if you know if the space would you know the if they had this much um you know an interest in the Balkans, it's been shrunk to basically this. They can only see like two or three things, basically. Slovenia is having elections on Sunday. Yansha has been the most, also a very pro Orban and pre, pro um, not, I mean, his pro government outlets in Slovenia have been obviously very supportive of Ukraine, but I don't think he personally has sort of um, ever walked back any of the Orban uh, connections. And obviously, they're still, the business connections are still flourishing. Um, there was an incident again in North Macedonia recently when the Bulgarian government visited and nobody in the EU reacted, um, you know, and there are provocations on all sides and now, you know, they're being covered a lot less. And the worst thing of all of these, obviously, is the fact that they're, despite Vucic's, um, or Serbia's rather, um, uh, reluctance or refusal to participate in sanctions um, and all that. I don't think there's been enough criticism from the EU with regard to this because the set situation on the ground in Belgrade, I was um, uh, still living there when the, uh, uh, the renewed invasion started in February and people have just doubled down on their pro-Russian views because locals, average citizens, sadly um, commiserate with, they, they commiserate with a country that is being seen as an enemy or like as bad guys, everyone else in the world. They're, they don't commiserate with Ukrainians as much as, obviously it's not everyone, but most people don't commiserate as much with Ukrainians as they do with Russians. And uh, the Serbian politicians have only doubled down on their support for Putin and Russia, as is reflected in, in pro-government, but also pro-Russian outlets, as Ivana said earlier. So I don't see you know it going anywhere unless, um, you know, as terrible as it's gonna sound, unless, certain Balkan politicians consciously piggyback on this interest, um, this Western interest in uh, Russian interventionist and destabilizing policies and literally talk about it every single day all the time, which I haven't seen. You know, I've seen the solidarity statements and everything, which is great, but I, if I was, you know, a Bosnian, uh, any Bosniak politician in Bosnia, if I was um, you know, Kosovo Albanian politician in Kosovo, if I, all these, you know, North, all Ma North Macedonian politicians, I would just talk about it every day. You know, Bulgaria, the, I mean, North Macedonia and Bulgaria is a great example because despite the prime minister, who's the lone voice in the government right now, who is supportive of Ukraine, their parliament yesterday just failed to pass a bill to send weapons to Ukraine and to allow for more native troops in the country because the, um, the, you know, the sentiment, the pro-Russian sentiment in the country is so strong. And, you know, so so Brussels is not very tuned in to how this plays out in the Balkans, unless people talk, politicians, journalists, um, activists talk about it every day, because they're not going to draw the lines. These are people who barely understood things before, let alone now, when they can, you know, when they can focus on what is sadly one of the biggest humanitarian crises as well that is developing on the European continent um, since the Balkan Wars, uh, since the Yugoslav disintegration war, sorry. Yep. Thanks, uh, Una. Uh, Richard, and then Kurt. Can you hear me? Richard. All right, thank you, Tanya. 
so whether it's Kosovo um, or whether it's media freedoms, which are, are, are both very key issues, and I want to I want to maybe build on a little bit of what Ivana said about media freedom. But first, you know, talk whether it, it, it's Croatia. Um, actually, if, if those who have been following Romania a little bit, Romania has not been too on board with getting too engaged in this, and, and our own Secretary Austin had to kind of ring up his counterparts in, in Bucharest lately to, to say, oh, what about this law that you said you would repeal that would allow the transfer of weapons to, to non-NATO member states? And you know, Romania has been dragging on that. I agree. I don't know how aware Brussels is on this and how hard they're, they're pushing on these issues, despite, again, recognizing the fact that there's a real inflection point here where democratic West has a moral high ground and they have the economic imperative vis-a-vis -vis these various sanctions and, their, and the justifications underlying them to really start to use some sticks in order to encourage the kind of democratic behavior necessary for transatlantic security. Um, when I look at Serbia, I mean, at least up until current events, you talk, you know, I think Ivana was the one who had mentioned how if you look at Russia, you know, there's all these preliminary red flags when something bad is going to happen. So, oh, geez, I don't know. How about we tramp down on media in Serbia? We'll have some fun time parades on Serbia Day. And oh, by the way, we're going to jump our military expending the expenditure to unprecedented levels in recent years. If that if those aren't red flags, I'm kind of confused as to what is. And so this idea that somehow like Serbia is going to be the guiding like anchor of stability in, in the Western Balkans, to me demonstrates a real lack of understanding about who's controlling level of powers and exactly where Alexander Vucic comes from and how he maintains that power. Getting to media freedom, if I can, to just touch on that real quick, you know, watching again, Polls in, in closed societies are difficult, but watching how effective Russian propaganda has been amongst their own people, like if that isn't very clear to those that have been skeptical about how damaging and how disconcerting it is when you see encroachments on media freedoms in European states, like wake up, it's very clear. And it can have toxic effects that are going to have blowback to that potentially those who are concerned with transatlantic security are going to have to manage for some time to come. I would advocate as others have, you know what seems to be effective with a lot of these governments, at least it's been working for Russia and China, everyone understands it's quid pro quo. And maybe we don't need to have that discussion in the public fora, but there needs to be a very a real change in behavior coming from Brussels, Washington, and arguably London, that like, look, you're gonna get on board and we're going to invest and, and support your country in its transition to prosperity and hopefully a, a functioning democracy but you gotta show up. And if you're not doing it, we have other places, other actors, other interests that we're gonna support rather than waste time on you as we have thus far. Thank you. Uh, Tanya, should I go ahead? Or... Yeah, I'm sorry, okay. over to you, yes. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, a, a few additional points to, to, to Una and Richard's points. I mean, definitely, I mean, the, the West has been treating treating Vucic with kid gloves for a very long time. And it's all been about the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue, uh, Belgrade-Pristina dialogue, and, uh, that, um, and, and he's been cut slack on his complete authoritarianization, cornering the market uh, politically, media-wise. He's put himself in a, so he's done this geopolitical arbitrage for a very long time, very well. He's still doing it. It's a little harder now, but he's he could count on the EU and the United States to give him a lot of latitude. I mean, that that vote in the UNGA bought him a lot of cushion. There's all this. Don't pressure them. Don't push them too far. They might go over to the bad guys. It's like, oh, go give it a whirl. See how that goes. Uh, but there's no will to to to, to confront them about that. Uh, one thing, though, that, that Vucic has put himself in a box, uh, and I think it might he might taste the lash of this, is the Russians have build, been building a popular constituency among Serbians and Serbs more broadly. Not, and he's been helping them do it through the media he controls. So now you actually have enormous depth of popularity for, for the Russian view, even if he did want to pivot, it's a little harder than it would have been before because he's, he's magnified 
as a bargaining chip to try to extract more from the EU and, and the United States. Um, and so uh, it doesn't mean that our policies should not be greater sticks. I, I completely think that's the case. And again, we could really limit the amount of damage, not just Vucic, but Zagreb, uh, Milorad Dodik, others can do by just taking things off the table. If everybody was assured that conflict of any kind would not be allowed now or in the future, uh, it's awfully hard to pursue these political agendas because that's that's what it's all about. As, as Rave mentioned earlier, and I, I agree, the number one thing, the only thing the Croatians bring to the table in EU fora is about Bosnia intellectual. Only thing they're on about. They've managed to smuggle it into the, uh, the strategic compass, which has nothing to do. It's, it's completely incongruent there. And then they, they use that as a talking point. Uh, so it's our engagement with these, these governments. This is why I mentioned the values that's so important. Because so long as this is geopolitics only of alignment, we're going to get ourselves in trouble the way we did in the Cold War. There are, there's a lot of baggage that we're still trailing behind us outside the European theater, if it's clear, where we, we allowed people to, to juke us and say, you got you to support us because we're anti-communist. And, and I, I'm really worried that we're going to fall for that. And we, we, uh, I'm hoping that the way that Ukraine is putting values front and center, and Zelensky is forcing values to be central to the discussion about this, is going to help help uh, be a prophylactic against further going in that direction. But there needs to be, we need to view this as a constituency element. The only way these countries are firmly ever gonna be rooted in the West is if it has deep popular roots. And I think the hardest place that's gonna be is Serbia. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Now, um, I have a question or comment for Ivana and then Richard. It's from a journalist at the Geo Post, and they he wants to know what your views are about Serbia's Vucic being closer to Putin than to the West. And I, I do think that the comments we've just had have alluded to this. If you want to add something, Ivana, uh, please do it now. And if you miss something, Richard, uh, follow up. Well, I certainly believe that Vucic's beliefs are more aligned with Moscow than with Washington. However, Vucic's ideology, the only ideology that he believes in is to stay in power. That's number one ideology. Yes. He and that trumps everything. Um, and he's a, he praises himself as a very pragmatic leader. Um, if you, for example, um, reads his li listen listens to his rhetorics nowadays, he's willing to throw Russia under the bus, but it's only going to be in the short run, of course, uh, buying the time and observing uh, geopolitics. Uh, but at the same time, he is actually more now shifting towards China because he needs to have another, um, another uh, car to play, uh, to use against the West. And I firmly, you know, agree with what Kurt stated in terms of democracy promotion. Uh, there is nothing uh, that Vucic uh, fears more than pure democracy uh, in, in, in Serbia. Um, so I think, you know, if we are talking about certain values, including the EU, that's something, you know, that we should definitely pursue. Uh, uh, other, otherwise, you know, he's going to continue to use his uh, well-known playbook uh, to basically blackmail the West saying, oh, if you, if you don't do this, then I'm going to move towards uh, Russia or, or China. So uh, whether I believe that he that he is more aligned with, with the West or East um, at this point really is irrelevant because the only thing that he is purely aligned is to stay in power as long as possible. Thanks, I would, I would just add very briefly um, you know, Serbia, in, in, in my estimate, is, is, is very unique in, in, in that the Russians have done such an exceptional job 
in their influence operations that you know, it, to the extent that a given government, in this instant, Alexander Vucic is in the SNS, doesn't choose to, to follow Moscow's line, they have a number of means by which they can very readily push back if they want to. And when I spoke about the contentiousness that I believe will be the Balkan space, should we enter in a, a Cold War-like scenario in the coming years, it's precisely these kind of characteristics. I very much agree with Ivana that I think Alexander Vucic first and foremost is a, everyone has their, their certain world perspectives, but he's a political animal and he's interested in keeping himself in power. It's very dangerous in an undemocratic country because those individuals, when they feel that their survival is at stake, much like I've observed by comparison in Turkey over the past 12 years, they will lash out and they will engage in activities and behaviors that can really unsettle a lot of otherwise core Atlantic interests. And for that reason, I, am, I wish I could be more optimistic about how he may or may not be able to reorient in the coming years. But my fear is that popular sentiment in support of Russia, commiseration was a great word, Luna. That's exactly it. I'm not sure how quickly that's gonna be overcome. So it's, it's more than just the guy sitting in the big chair. There's a lot in Serbia that, that Russia can play to their advantage going forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Una, you have a comment on this, this uh, topic? Um, no, I just really wanted to emphasize uh, that the, the rhetoric in the Balkans from politicians who represent the most vulnerable communities has not been, um, has not risen up to the occasion. And I'm, you know, considering that on day one, every single theme, every single um, maneuver, every single false flag was something that, that we had all seen in some form or another, or another in the 90s. Um, I thought that, you know, um, Balkan leaders, like especially people who represent communities whose needs are often overlooked for the sake of compromise or stability in the region would, you know, be better at, at highlighting that internationally. And I don't think they have. And, and, and yeah. Okay. Um, I want to go over to Ralph. We got a question on uh, NATO expansion in the region. And, you know, I'm going to sort of frame this as well. Given what is going on in Ukraine, we do see that uh, the EU seems to be interested in advancing uh, EU membership to uh, Ukraine, notwithstanding all the problems that they have, because they're like a lot of transitional democracies. They have a lot of challenges to face up to while their country's being destroyed. Nonetheless, this could be the moment for Ukraine to join the EU. Um, is that premise, that, that actual manifestation, does that extend to NATO as well, Ralph? And what are your thoughts on Kosovo expansion um, and BIH expansion uh, into NATO? Uh, and uh, it, what are your thoughts about that in relationship to this situation right now? Uh, Kosovo, I think, first will have to be recognized by uh, NATO members who do not yet recognize Kosovo as a country. Uh, I think Kosovo will have uh, a very tough time in the near future regarding uh, the, you know, the, 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 the position of certain NATO members vis-a-vis -vis Vucic. Uh, and I think this love of Vucic will hurt uh, Kosovo's prospects more than, more than Bosnia's. Um, because Kosovo is now at a point in, in terms of the narrative within the uh, diplomatic community of, of being the problem. So people don't, you know, they, they're just, there's so little, you know, commiseration, as Una would say. People don't feel very, uh, they feel in a way fed up. When you talk to people behind closed doors, you'll hear them talk about how difficult Albin has been, uh, which I think is not the case. I think Albin has protected Kosovo's interests uh, the, the way he thinks is, is the, you know, the way to do. Uh, but Kosovo will have, I think, I think Kosovo will pay some sort of an invoice uh, to the West for, for their, their attempt at wooing Vucic, getting Vucic on their side. When it comes to Bosnia, I think the situation is, is somewhat different because Bosnia has the luxury, and you know, this is a public event, so I'll say it, but Bosnia has the luxury of Doric because Doric has gone so, so far off the deep end that uh, it's very, very difficult to defend him. I mean, even his 
a uh, tacit uh, support in Germany has waned uh, as of as of last few months. Uh, so you know he's he's the one now on the chopping block politically in many ways in the West, and Vucic is not. And Vucic has managed to put some sort of distance between him and Doric in that sense. And so because of that, I think Bosnia has a remote chance of joining NATO in the you know 2022 2026 um, window. So the, the, there's going to be an election in Bosnia, a general election coming up in a few months in October. And I think the new government will have a chance to join NATO because Bosnia has uh, unlocked map. It has activated the membership action plan and is slowly approaching NATO. So if there is a, 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 a good outcome for Bosnia in terms of co coalition negotiations after the 2022 elections, I think there's a, a reasonable chance. It's not likely, but it's, it's fairly possible that Bosnia might join NATO by the end of uh, 2026. Uh, now, that's, that's, I know that I sound too optimistic for, for some of the listeners and certainly for Kurt, I know. But I think Doric is really up against the wall now politically. And it's very, very difficult for people who are very much in, in, in his corner, even Orban's people, to defend him um, because he's just done things that, he, I mean, he, they organized a public event yesterday, a rally, uh, which uh, just blew up in their face because some of the activists there decided to sing about uh, murder of Christian Schmidt, who, who hasn't been really the worst option for Doric's people because he has refused to use bomb powers for, for you know, a year now. I mean, he's done his best to give Doric space to do his thing, right? Because the idea, as Kurt says, is to, to trade uh, Doric's recognition of Christian Schmidt for uh, the uh, state property. That, that's the idea, right? And it's not going to come to pass because Doric has just behaved very irresponsibly and has not, uh, he hasn't uh, toned down in time, in my view. Thanks, Ralph. I, the one thing that you really know quite a bit about is Turkey. Turkey is a NATO member. Turkey is playing interesting uh, politics, geopolitics too at this time. Um, are they, is, would Turkey support Balkan expansion into NATO? What kind of role are they playing right now? I, I believe they are sending weapons to uh, Ukraine. Is that correct? Ralph? No, yeah, yes. Turkey has actually ma managed to, to come out as a winner of the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine because Turkey has now showed to the West that it's much more important for the West than people wanted to admit, especially people in Washington, especially people in Biden's orbit. Uh, and on the other hand, Turkey has uh, really gotten Ukraine some very meaningful help. So the Bayraktar uh, drones are, you know, there's even a song about I mean, I mean, I'm sure anybody that follows Ukraine has heard the Bayraktar song, right? So Turks, you know, Turks are in, in a better position than they were a year ago. In terms of their Balkans policy, uh, many people doubt their intentions. Many people think that they are playing some sort of a double game with the Russians, which honestly speaking, I don't see. I don't think Turkey has the luxury of doing that. And Turkey wants to be relevant and they're struggling to be relevant. And they are exceptionally pro-NATO. I mean, they are, they are the, the, along with the UK, and I, I think one of the things we failed to do at this panel, I got to criticize us, is uh, that we haven't talked about the, the, the exceptionally uh, important and positive role that the UK has played in the region in the last few months and few years. So Turkey, along with the UK, has done tremendously uh, uh, well in terms of promoting the importance of NATO membership. They've acted as a counterweight to the German skepticism uh, in this regard, and uh, I think Turkey will do its best to promote uh, NATO prospects for Bosnia, and has done a lot so you know so far. Uh, and Turkey will will certainly play a role in that. Now, how they their relationship with Vucic now is is a whole different thing. I would I would um, try to divorce that from their uh, NATO and defense policy. I think those are two different things. Their commercial policy and their defense policy, in my view, do not go hand in hand so much in the Balkans. I'll try to keep it short so others can can also chime in. Uh, Una, you want to make a comment? Let's uh, let's make a comment and move quickly because we have two more questions before us. Yeah, 
sorry, um, just because I feel like this is this we would have gotten to this in the conversation organically before, but there's obviously so much to talk about. Um, sure. I think the biggest similarity to sort of what the Balkans is facing, Balkans are facing um, and faced before the um, la- uh, before February 24th is the fact that this complete and utter denial of the existence of a Ukraine, Ukrainian nation. And this is something that I've written about and I think everyone here at Palma has written about and covered in different ways extensively. And I think this is something that the West inherently does not understand. Like, even when the war ends, Russia is not going to turn around and say, okay, we accept the Ukraine, existence of a Ukrainian people. You know, this is something that Bosniaks in particular face in the Balkans, but also something that is faced by Kosovo Albanians in terms of the right to self-determination. And these are the two, you know, things that people have to have in mind going forward. Um, again, something that the Balkans can, can kind of also highlight Ukrainian suffering, but also bring you know, their experience in handling that, you know, into the public sphere and other people are focused on it. I've seen my colleagues, reporters and stuff like that, uh, who cover the conflict sort of brush it off and be like, yeah, Russia just says that as a talking point. And I feel like they don't understand the inherent and deep seated nature of completely denying the existence of another nation um, as a separate and, and legitimate ethnic group. So yeah. That's yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And I will also say <clears throat> that in the manifesto put out by the Russians, uh, Timothy Snyder calls it the most genocide defined document he's ever seen it during his career. And so the attempt to erase a people, to not recognize the people, as I like to say about Hirman, we teach Ukrainian studies, we teach the Ukrainian language. So when you start talking about erasing, uh, I agree with you completely, Una, on this point, and I do think it speaks to the genocide, their their intent to, in part or whole, eradicate a people. That's my view on it. So I, I just want to re- reaffirm what you're saying. We, we have another uh, question uh, from uh, Amanda Brown. Is it? Um, yes, Amanda Brown and Kurt wants to take this. Can you discuss the impact of sanctions on Bosnian separatist leaders on influencing behavior and what additional sanctions might be effective? Um, what, what are your thoughts here, Kurt? Well, I mean, uh, I think the, the, the sanctions that have been applied have been by the United States and Britain. Uh, to uh, And Britain just followed uh, by applying sanctions to both uh, Bosnian Serb member of the president, state presidency, Milorad Dodik, and, and Bosnian Serb president, Joko Svjanovic. Um, I, I think they're mostly symbolic in effect, which is not to say insignificant, but, but if you really want to hit assets, those are in the European Union. There was an enormous self-inflicted act of, of, of neutering themselves that the European Union did at behest of, of Hungary and Croatia uh, the, 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 the restrictive measures that had been agreed that were able to be applied to people who were threatening uh, peace, Dayton, uh, territorial integrity, and so on, that was agreed in 2011. Those are renewed every year, but uh, the annual renewal had to be by consensus. But the actual vote to apply those sanctions could be by qualified majority vote, which is 55% of member states, 65% of the population of the EU. The Hungarians threatened, if you don't make this by consensus, we'll, we'll, we'll cast a veto, and the, and the Croatians supported them. Instead of calling Hungary's bluff and saying, okay, give that a whirl, and the very worst case, at least the Hungarians take the blame for, for, for in making it unable for the European Union to apply sanctions. Um, they accepted a Greek proposal to make this for two years rather than one. So kick the can down the road for two years and make this by consensus, which means there will be no European sanctions on anybody in Bosnia and Herzegovina for two years. They might be individually levied. Some countries like the Germans say they can't do that unless it's multilateral. I think there are ways around it. If there's a will, there's a way. But um, we haven't seen anybody really go to bat for that. So you had five countries, the Benelux three, the Germans and the Czechs earlier say, yeah, we want to sanction Dota. But then I haven't seen any moves to unilaterally sanction except from the Dutch. So uh, Vienna is where the money is. If you really want to nail these guys, 
that's their, you know, that's their Miami. Uh, so uh, that's something. One point that I want to, so, so I think that there won't be sanctions that really bite these guys uh, anytime soon, unfortunately. There are other things we could do to really make their lives difficult if we wanted to. Uh, but that's limiting their room to maneuver here. Uh, the ultimate sanction is the high reps tool, uh, the, the, the bond powers. One quick thing about NATO on Bosnia. Um, I don't think Bosnia is going to get into NATO under this constitution, period. Because effectively, you have the presidency. You have a, you, you'd be important, importing a Dodik veto or a Bosnian, whoever his successor would be. Uh, there is a there is a legal security guarantee for Bosnia Herzegovina right now, but it's not credible because don't have enough troops on the ground. And I think that is the one that needs to be reinforced in the immediate term prior to the October elections. Thanks for your question. Oh, thank thanks, Kurt. i um, I just also want to reinforce on the lack, you know, not enough soldiers. I know Kurt and I've talked about this. Ralph and I've talked about this. We talked to Tivan about this probably even Richard, that there should be a maneuver infantry brigade uh, reinforcing a NATO reinforcement, and that'd be approximately 5,000 soldiers. And the key place to situate them is in Birchgo. And until that's done, I, I still think um, BIH is vulnerable. Uh, let me also add, speaking of sanctions, just yesterday, the State Department issued sanctions on 587 Russian individuals, uh, among other specific people, uh, it seems like a major uh, effort uh, by the State Department. And we also know, all of us know that sanctions alone aren't going to get us to where we want to be at peace, at peace with no war. But there is an unprecedented effort, I think, right now by the State Department to really, really go after people on accountability uh, based upon human rights abuses and violations. So just to be noted, um, we have not mentioned the new U.S. ambassador to Serbia yet. And we have a comment from the audience uh, once again, all of us have been talking about, and everybody on this panel has written about the lack of um, Western diplomacy, in particular, all of us have been very critical of the United States on, on uh, diplomacy uh, in, the, in the Western Balkans. But uh, now, now Chris Hill has arrived, and boy, he really picked a moment to show up in Belgrade. Uh, this has got to be very tough. I still maintain um, some of us have worked with Chris Hill. We go, we go back. We know him. He is known for being a very tough, tough person, a straight shooter, doesn't pull any punches, don't know what his agreements are with Washington. Ambassadors don't make policy. They carry it out. I, I'd like to hear um, what you have to say about this, Ralph, I'd like to hear um, Ivana as well, and, and uh, uh, Ralph Byrovich. S start with you, Kurt. About didn't this. I didn't hear, I didn't hear my name, Paul. Look, I think Chris Hill, the relative weight, I mean, he's senior, he came out of retirement to do his job. So I think that's, that's a reflection of how important Belgrade is seen in this equation, but that makes me nervous because the United States has been been behind this this open Balkan idea, which looks to me like the greater Serbian, greater Albanian co-prosperity sphere. Uh, obviously, with different motivations from Belgrade and Tirana. Uh, so uh, I do think that de facto, while ambassadors don't typically make policy, I think he was sent to be sort of minister plenipotentiary regionally. Mm -hmm. And, okay. uh, and so the lack of a high altitude strategy from Washington, I think this goes for Bosnia, I think it goes for the region, uh, it's gonna have to be knit together here and sold back upstream. Uh, and I don't know what his marching orders were. I think the general marching orders for all American diplomats posted here are basically keep it quiet, solve it. And the low road to doing that is to cut deals with the powers that be and that could be very detrimental if you're actually wanting to, to, to have real stable, real stability. 
and long-term constituencies for, for Western democratic values and ultimately Thanks. these countries joining our clubs. Thanks. Ivana, you wanna take a crack? No, I don't have anything else actually. To <laughs> okay, okay. Um, is Ralph still with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm here, yeah. Okay, so uh, you're gonna, you're the last answer of this, uh, this program. I wanna thank all of our panelists. It's been an amazing, uh, amazing ar around the world uh, in relationship to Ukraine and what's going on in the Western Balkans. Ralph. Yes, so uh, I agree with Kurt. It is too early to tell as to what Chris Hill is going to be doing in Belgrade. Based on the first uh, few weeks, I don't think he's going to be much different uh, than uh, what we've seen from people in the region in the last several years. So I think the uh, key uh, goal that he has before him is to get Vucic to somehow abandon Russia and join the West. And uh, we'll see how that goes, but I'm not very optimistic uh, about Mr. Hill's ability to pull it off. However, I completely agree with Kurt. He is going to be seen, by, certainly by... Oh, he just froze up. We're getting an audio. Uh, Ralph is frozen up. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you again to everyone. I hope I see you sooner rather than later in person. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. And, I'll, and um, we'll be sharing the YouTube link uh, to everybody. Uh, thank, thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you very much, Tanya. Thanks, thanks so much. It was very, very good. Thank you. Bye-bye.